we go. Jake and Josh are here to analyze the game they love for the team they love. And this is another Dolphins podcast with your hosts, Jake Mendel and Josh House. We are slowly painting the picture of the 2024 season, and I have two of the best painters joining me today. Welcome into another edition of Another Dolphins Podcast. We are going through some news and notes from organized team activities. We're talking Devon Achan. We're talking Eric Ezukama, and maybe a complete 180 on defense. But for a late May podcast, I couldn't be more excited. Cat Joshua Houts, gentlemen. Happy uh, Thursday. How's the week? Getting, getting stoked for the weekend? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, n- this is the time of the year where there's not much football news going on and football is the only sport I follow. So uh, it, that, there's that. But no, that's, uh, you know, after the draft, uh, you know, kind of kind of taking a little bit of time off uh, is, is nice, you know, allows us to kick up our feet and, and talk about some fun stuff. Yeah, well, you mentioned it. We do hit that, you know, kind of law between, um, I guess, the OTAs and training camp that's coming up, but we do have some news to talk about. So um, as we always say, Jake, it's just fun to be able to come on here and talk Dolphins football. And, um, you know, you do say that this is kind of the down part, but it is funny how there was one point in my life where I did think there was an off season, but now it just seems like every day and maybe it's just social media and things like that. But every day, you know, you're just glued there because something's coming out, whether it's to a at OTAs, not at OTAs, whether it's the quotes that we're going to talk about, it's just uh, a never ending cycle, despite how it does seem like we have so long until the season begins. Speaking of things that are fun, how about video games? Would you like to win a copy of College Football 25? You get one entry for a giveaway we are doing. One entry right away, right off the bat. If you send a Dolphins football-related question to another Dolphins podcast at gmail.com. I tried taking ADP at gmail.com. That was unavailable. I know it's a little on the long side, but I do put it in the description of every podcast. So go ask us a question. Maybe you'll get a free video game to play for a couple months here before Madden comes in and takes over the entire uh, fan base. And also with that, if you are desperate for a copy of College Football 25, you get two additional entries if, with that email, you include a screenshot of you rating this show on a podcast platform of your choice. So go out there, go do that, and we will announce a winner on July 7th. So you'll have more than enough time to go out and pre-order it, whatever it may be. But gentlemen, this is the time of year that it's so hard to decode everything. What is actual information? What is, you know, just kind of a reporter who has their eyes just locked in on a specific player during these OTAs. One time though, where we can really figure out if the dolphins are moving in the direction comes during the preseason, specifically when the dolphins host joint practices with different teams. Last year, we saw them do joint practices with what was it? The, uh, Atlanta Falcons and Houston Texans last year. The year before, remember hearing about the Eagles and the Dolphins having joint practices where they talked about meeting in the Super Bowl. Only one of those teams lived up to the promise. But, Kat, I want to ask you, this season that the Dolphins will have joint practices with the Atlanta Falcons, Washington Commanders, and Tampa Bay Buccaneers each of their three preseason games. It's not the most, you know, you aren't going to go win a game on a Wednesday, but these are the practices, I feel, that you can really kind of get an idea of some strengths and weaknesses of the roster. You sure can. And I like the mix of those three teams when at a time where Anthony Weaver's defense is coming together here uh, later in the summer, because you've got the you've you said the Bucks, the Commanders and the Falcons uh, as the three teams. So you've got you're playing against two veteran quarterbacks, Kirk Kirk Cousins and Baker Mayfield. And then you're going to also be able to, you know, size your defense up with Jaden Daniels who makes plays with his legs. So you're going to get a good mix of all three different or, or two different styles of, of quarterback there. So I, I am looking forward to that. So I'm, I'm glad they're doing these, these joint practices like they do every year. Yeah. We're even getting a, what a Kendall Fuller revenge joint practice. Uh, do we even go that deep? But um, it's cool because these things are starting to become more common. And um, I guess at least from the coach's perspective, you wonder how much tweaking they do right throughout the week. You're seeing these one-on-one matchups and then you go into preseason. And although it's meaningless, I mean, I'm sure they're sitting there trying to tweak things and see how they can attack the defense differently to, you know, prepare for the season. So um, as cliche as it is, iron sharpens iron, I guess the biggest thing 
Um, for me, is I just want to get out of it without any injuries because, um, you know, you can knock on wood or blue in the face, but we know, as we saw last year, once, you know, you start getting down on that depth chart, uh, things start to spiral out of control. So I just pray that when there, when iron is sharpening iron, when we are sitting here tweeting about these battles, um, you know, he's even how to get put in a blunder against Calvin Ridley. Cause he's running like a, what's like, he ran like this 13 minute route and everyone's like, Oh man, X is, well, X might've been cooked. They might've been on to something, but um, I'm hyped for it. Just no injuries, please. It breaks up camp. Like McDaniel said last year when discussing the joint practices, it also gives a little newness to it. It reinvigorates, but it also, there's only so much scheme that one side of the ball can have. And I think that's so, so, uh, it's a nice curveball when you go to these practices. You're seeing different schemes, you're seeing different players, and you see less and less of the in team fighting, right? When, you know, you're practicing in Miami for weeks straight, you're eventually going to get annoyed, a little frustrated. It's nice when you can kind of blow up on someone that's not on your team. So there's no lingering effects there. But, guys, before we get into the news and notes from this wave of OTAs, which I believe the Dolphins have OTAs going May 20, 21st. That's where the majority of the information we got from for today. May 23rd today, the Dolphins are out there on the field. So any news that comes on, comes out of that, we'll be sure to hit on it. And then they'll wrap them up. May 28th, 29th, and 31st. But guys, we've been covering the Dolphins for a long time. Kat, I was going through my phone recently, and I saw some old web weekend pictures uh, that we had from about 10 years ago. And it's crazy to say this, but looking back on when the Dolphins drafted him in the first round of the 2015 draft, would you have ever believed that Devontae Parker would last nine years in the NFL before uh, calling it a career? Man, it's... Yeah, that's he, he retired, and called it a career is the first round pick in the 2015 draft. And that's a, a very personal one to me because that's the only draft I ever attended. Uh, and when he was a first rounder and uh, yeah, it's, he's somebody that I've, I've defended. I defended when he was here more than a lot of other people. I mean, because mm -hmm. I've, I've always been of the opinion that I'd rather have a great player for 12 games and he's going to miss five than an Albert Wilson who might play all 17 games but not at a high level. So I've loved what he brought to the table. And we're only five years removed from this guy leading all AFC wide receivers in receiving yards with Ryan Fitzpatrick at quarterback. That's, that's nuts. So, and he was the uh, oldest drafted dolphin um, currently in the NFL. Uh, so that's crazy. yeah, that's crazy too. And so dolphins don't have one in the NFL older than that. Um, you've got a few guys like Billy Turner and Ryan Tannehill who are free agents. He'll probably sign somewhere, but still. Um, uh, best wishes to Devontae Parker in retirement. Yeah, I echo that. I mean, if you go back and, you know, I was trying to find some of the videos because at one point I had Ryan Tannehill throwing a pokeball downfield. To, it was, I think, uh, way back when Devontae Parker skied up against Baltimore, made yeah. that catch early in his career. Um, but, yeah, it's just funny how far along we've come because I was writing down while you mentioned Devontae Parker. During that draft, I had photoshops like Melvin in, or Melvin Gordon to the Dolphins, Todd Gurley to the Dolphins. I think even Kelvin White I had photoshopped. And, <laughs> oh, my God, that was just absolutely brutal. So um, you got to love what Devontae Parker did here. He, to me, is like – I, I think of a wide receiver one and i know nowadays it's changing but he's just that big bodied receiver that he never got the separation but if he was in one-on-one -on -one coverage and i mean we see it now with tyree kill and jalen waddle but this dude had a different type of game to him where he would go up and you know take on some of those one uh you know contested throws so it's been seven season with the dolphins like you mentioned best year with ryan fitzpatrick so we wish him the best was kind of intrigued to see what he might do in that philadelphia eagles um offense but you can't you know be upset with a man who said that he wants to go spend more time with his family and um let's be honest he's definitely you know closer to retirement than he is to his uh you know going out there and making some significant plays so all the best to you, Devontae Parker. I got to say one thing about the 2015 draft, too. Uh, a couple of picks before Devontae Parker, it was one or two picks before, uh, uh, the Saints drafted Andres Pete mm -hmm. uh, out of Stanford. And so in the middle of the draft, I went back up to my hotel room. I had to go get something. And uh, I got in the elevator, and there's this woman decked out in all Stanford gear. That's where Andres Pete went to, went to school. And I said, oh, uh, Stanford uh, just had a player draft and she and she said yeah it was my uh, she either said I don't know I was drinking a little bit so uh, it's it was either my son or my nephew she said it's let's I think it was this, I think she said it was my net it's yeah but that was my nephew and when they drafted him all the Saints fans booed and I was trying to explain to her that yeah it's because you know wide receivers and running backs were drafted all around him and everything and linemen aren't she like, and she goes, oh, and he's such a good boy too. And I had to give her a big hug. And uh, 
it was just a creepy elevator moment. But uh, that was a <laughs> it was a you'll fun never time forget it though. You'll never forget <laughs> it. <laughs> so uh, and I think Andres P is with the Raiders now. I think since our last show, he got he got signed there. So anyway, I've taken us way off track there, Jake. <laughs> But that's kind of where Devontae Parker was at his best, best, right? Ball's off track. He's going to go up and go catch it. Uh, that 2019 season, the usage was insane. He was targeted 128 times. He had 72 receptions, 1,202 total yards. And Josh, you mentioned that number one wide receiver. God, did we want him to be A.J. Green so badly. Like we wanted Ryan Tannehill to reach the ceiling that was Andy Dalton. <laughs> And we needed him to have his wide receiver one in A.J. Green, Devontae Parker. And all of a sudden, man, it's crazy that we go from that desperately hoping they could make fetch a thing with Parker and Tannehill. And now you're posting videos about how Mike McDaniel can scheme up uh, Jalen Waddle for a 30-yard touchdown that makes it look like a ground out to second base. So if you're not following how it's on Twitter, he recently posted every single one of Tua's uh, touchdown passes from last year. Just go back and see how simple this coach has made Miami Dolphins football. And looking ahead, looking at what the Dolphins are doing in OTAs for our first note here today, Travis Wingfield, who works for the Miami Dolphins, he had the line of the summer. I'm not going to let this go. And he was just kind of saying it as a one-liner, but he said in the first going of OTAs, he said Devon Achen caught a million passes on a million different routes. So, Kat, I want to ask you that the Dolphins just brought in Odell Beckham Jr., but how can they really make this running back group that's pretty loaded work maybe with a couple uh, targets here and there every other game? Yeah, and Odell Beckham, if we haven't had a show since since he was signed, um, I was not tremendously in favor of signing him. But then again, I also didn't think he would – I thought he would sign for a lot more than what he did. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm past it. I'm fine with it. But the major reason was because I felt that there were going to be a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And right. this is part of that. You know, you've got Tyreek Hill, you've got Jalen Waddle, obviously. Uh, a chance going to catch a lot of passes. He caught a lot of passes in the last few games of, of last season. He was targeted a lot. Uh, Jenu Smith is not a blocker. He is a receiving tight end. You know, you still have Ingold. You still have Durham Smythe. You got to get on the field. You've got this competition for the Dolphins, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth six receiver position. So, yeah, that's, um, that's going to be fascinating. But if you get the ball – out to Devon, HN in space, which I hope happens a lot more often this year. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one missed tackle and takes it to the house. So it, it's exciting to hear that they're getting him involved in the passing game this early on in the summer. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we hate to be those people that are like, you know, patting yourself on the shoulder. But, Jake, I know that we've no, had we a podcast. We where, I mean, sometimes you have to do it because no one else is going to do it. But we had a podcast where we say, you know, maybe that guy that the number – you know, who get him take on that number three wide receiver role might be out of the backfield. And we were all praying it would be Devon H. And I think people were even saying how he has a little bit of Tyree kill to his game, or maybe we could see him playing a little bit more receiver. Um, I, I don't want to backtrack too far, but the Devontae Parker thing, he did catch to his first touchdown pass. I saw that when backtracking. So a fun little nugget there, but I love hearing this. I love hearing Devon H. And's getting more involved. I have written down Mostert, saw 32 targets last season, H. And at 37. Um, they both had three touchdowns, both under 200 yards. So would love to see him get more involved. But like Kat said, I mean, you just signed Odell Beckham Jr. Who uh, Mike McDaniel admitted he has a role in mind for him. Johnny Smith kind of gets overlooked with a lot of these signings and even, you know, the Malik Washington's of the world. So there's a lot of mouths to feed. We're going to talk about another receiver that, you know, some people are overlooking. So I don't know how involved they're going to be, but when you just imagine having both those guys in the backfield, maybe you motion out H and you still have Moster or Moster back there. There's so many different chess pieces you can move and you can get, uh, you know, really creative. So, this could be the next evolution of this offense. Excited to see the way it works. And the fact that we're hearing this in, what, a week's worth of OTAs? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit excited about that. Yeah, so the Dolphins also brought back Salvan Ahmed uh, over the offseason. And just kind of going through his stats, um, I, I realized that he was targeted at least three times in six of eight games last year uh, before he suffered a season-ending injury. And then Devon Achan was targeted at least three times in six of seven games TN and last season. And that includes six targets in the playoff loss to the Chiefs. Kat, I want to ask you, though, how does this Dolphins offense find those answers when, you know, the weakness last year was those third down situations where it seemed like some defenses could kind of just pin Tyree Kill to the ground and just the Dolphins offense kind of felt useless at times. So how is it Devon Achan or even Odell Beckham? Where can they kind of find a weakness against opposing defenses? I mean, a lot of factors in play, I think, late in the season is that Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell were playing very hurt struggling more than usual to get open. They were playing better competition. 
Um, and they didn't have additional threats like Janu Smith, like Odell Beckham last year. So the, the Dolphins are really completely leaning in to the fastest odds in the NFL, maybe NFL history. That's, that's what they're going for. And they're looking for these receivers to separate in any weather condition all throughout the season. Now that could go, I think that could go very, very well. I think it could go very, very poorly too, because you take a look at last year when things went bad, they went badly because they weren't able to protect the quarterback. They, the receivers weren't getting open. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but you know, if, if the strategy is, Hey, we have to build the fastest skill position um, group in the NFL to have a chance against the Chiefs and against the Bills and against the AFC elites this year. This is our only shot to do it. That might be your best route. Braxton Barrios is another name we didn't even mention in there. So they have a lot of mouths to feed. And, uh, you know, as long as we don't replicate last season, you know, you're talking about how we kind of got stagnant towards the season. They started to figure out ways to game plan it. I think even Mike McDaniel himself said that he signed uh, jokingly signed Odell Beckham Jr. to just come in and catch third down passes and be a red zone target. So, um, you know, when you're relying on Braxton Berrios last season, now you got a guy like Odell Beckham who brings a little bit of a different, you know, type of wide receiver mold. And I saw a Warren Sharp post a stat and I wish I had the number, but the Dolphins were like number one against zone defenses. And it just made me think how, like, how do you even c cover the Dolphins? You just almost have to hope that they get tired and, you know, those injuries pile up because if they're that good against zone, you're not playing a man with Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle and all those other pieces. So um, exciting to see the chess match that's going to go on throughout the season. But I do think Odell Beckham will, will definitely see some of those targets. But, man, j just hearing about A-Chan and knowing that Jalen Wright can bring a factor in that way as well. Raheem Mostert, I mean, Jeff Wilson even saw some targets. Yeah, I'm excited for what the, what can happen with this offense. Finding answers will be such a such a key for this Miami Dolphins offense. And it's frustrating because it's not something we're going to know in week two, week three, right? We're going to have to wait till near the end of the season if you can see Devon A. Chan really win those one-on-one -on -one matchups over and over, if Odell Beckham can hold up and win those one-on-one -on -one matchups over and over. But, I mean, it is pretty exciting to know that these guys aren't going to be able to uh, – face some top tier competition on the defensive end. Like you're going to be facing number three cornerbacks. You're going to be facing linebackers in these, in these coverages. So I'm excited to see what Mike McDaniel can do with that unit. I think getting Devon Achan the ball as a receiver can only help in terms of uh, limiting injuries, keep him healthy, keep him going for a 17 game season. So that'll be a fun dynamic, how the dolphins really give and pull with their uh, running back group. Moving on to the receivers, though, gentlemen, Eric Ezukama has officially been cleared to return to football. He said during OTAs he was actually cleared near the end of last season. Just going to go out on a whim here and say that the Dolphins probably decided to play it safe, just close him down for the year, come back this year. Uh, but, Kat, before we look at what Eric Ezukama can be this year, do you remember thinking about that wide receiver from Texas Tech who was drafted in the fourth round and what made him a, an appeal for some NFL franchises? Yeah, I mean, going back to when he was drafted, I I remember being a little surprised he was drafted in the fourth round because he was so raw. And but then he came out and you know in in preseason and he just had two monster games and it was like this guy looks like just a star. And then we don't hear from him all year. I think he had one catch for three yards as a rookie. And then the following training camp, you don't hear a whole heck of a lot about him. And then he's out there in the backfield <laughs> playing running back in the first quarter of the first game. Like, what the, what the hell's going on here? And he had one of the – he had a huge play in that game too. Remember when uh, against the Chargers, close to halftime for some reason, we th I thought it was insane that there was like seven seconds left and the Dolphins threw the ball downfield to Ezukama and J.C. Jackson basically tackles him and it's a pass interference call. The Dolphins get a field goal. They end up winning the game by two points at the end. So great. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that, he, that he's healed. And it, that wide receiver competition after Hill, Waddle, and Beckham is going to be fierce. I mean, you might end up seeing two or three wide receivers, very rosterable wide receivers getting cut. 
Yeah, and I mean, uh, I think that's what's so exciting is how he was used. I'm trying to temper my expectations and think that, you know, he isn't going to be this kind of a chess piece, this weapon that we saw in preseason. Because I know that we were doing a podcast, Jake, and we're sitting here talking about how successful he's been. And then we looked and we're like, oh, all that literally came in preseason. So um, he has been a preseason maven. You love the way they utilized him. You know, we can all joke and we're all going to joke and call him our Debo. But um, if this dude can, you know, come along and stay healthy and – even see some of those targets that he got in preseason. I mean, I'm definitely intrigued by it. But like Kat said, I mean, this receiving core is just absolutely insane. I mean, I'm sitting here rooting for Taj Washington to find a way on the roster. So I don't know how they're going to keep all these guys. Maybe use someone as trade bait. But hearing that Eric Ezekom is healed, I'm all for it. And I'm going to go back to Domo Jackson on Twitter. Um, uh, He once, I think, referred to him as like a, a Larry Fitzgerald light or something like that. And I can't get that out of my mind. So he can play inside, can play outside, a little bit bigger body. But yeah, let's see what he can do. He's our Debo Samuel, and, and no one can tell us otherwise. We spoke a little bit about being that third down key to the offense. And being Dolphin fans, I think that's why we're kind of getting a little too jazzed up about someone like Eric Azucama. This is someone that Mike McDaniel selected in his first draft. And I mean, we're getting jazzed up about Taj Washington. We're getting jazzed up about Malik Washington. Well, this is someone who was drafted two rounds earlier. Um, last season, he had eight receptions on nine targets. Now he only averaged like six to seven yards per reception. So it wasn't too, too flashy. And then he added, um, I think we talked about his rushing ability. He had two rush attempts for 52 yards. I think he broke up out a big one in Miami's second game. But Kat, talking about those third down um, conversions and Miami's hope to just keep the ball moving, doesn't it kind of seem like Eric Ezukamla can be like the, the safety blanket in a sense where you just have that one guy who can get six or seven yards. I mean, it's not going to be the flashiest stat line, but maybe when we look past the back, uh, the, the box score, excuse me, and you see someone who has like four receptions and they're all for first downs. What is Ezukama's skill set where he might stand out compared to uh, the guys he'll be competed with, whether it's uh, Odell Beckham, Braxton Berrios, Malik Washington? Yeah. See, I, I view him more as a decoy uh, on third downs as opposed to, a consistent threat. I mean, because separation is not the best part of his game. It's his versatility. And he's a big, he's a powerful slot guy. And have been looking for that. And, you know, they, they were looking for it when they signed Cedric Wilson. They were, they were looking for it with Trent Sherfield. They tried to shove him into that role. As a comma, you know, they draft him in the fourth round. So they've been looking for that type of player. And he, he's going to have a chance to come in here and 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 be that guy. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating. He can make a big impact, or he could be off the roster completely when when it, when August comes around. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to look up just to see if he was. I mean, and it would not really cost the Dolphins anything to get rid of him. It seems so. Yeah, definitely a player that you'd rather you know reach that potential. And we're talking about him. I mean, I think he's under contract through 2025. So even if he isn't you know that real dynamic factor, even if he just comes along a little bit and you have him you know then for 2025. I mean, at some point the Dolphins. I mean, we see the cap is slowly starting to shrink, and to have an Eric as you come and have some of those younger guys, I'm Malik Washington, like we mentioned, under contract. I mean. Um, it would definitely help the Dolphins out. So I'm intrigued by Eric Ezekama. I can go and retweet one of my old videos and we can all get hyped about it. But until we see it in a real game, I'm going to try to temper my expectations. Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, 1A, 1B. Odell Beckham, I think is, uh, there's not much debate. I think he's the third best wide receiver on the Dolphins. Where do you, where would you say is a realistic um, landing spot for Azukama if he goes through all the motions this year maybe he doesn't have a huge breakout year but maybe in the preseason just goes through all the steps yeah it catches another eight you know receptions on 11 targets let's say he has seven rush attempts for like 80 yards cat where would you place him if like it's just like a goes through with the process maybe not doesn't outkick expectations would he be near Beckham or would you think he'd still be uh competing with like a River Craycraft Braxton Barrios or even a Malik Washington for maybe that fourth or fifth wide receiver spot I mean I'd put him fourth in the pecking order at wide receiver if he plays up to his potential I mean uh maybe he does challenge Beckham and if, from that point that'd be Really fascinating uh, uh, to see how Odell Beckham responds to that. With the Ravens, he responded very well to that. Uh, you know, there mm -hmm. were a lot of games he wasn't featured and didn't catch a pass or caught one pass. So, um, yeah. I, but as far as the pecking order is concerned, you know, you've got to you get, just as a receiver, you got to have him above Braxton Berrios. Um, oh, yeah. And you know, Berrios I think makes the roster because he's a punt returner and and he's sure-handed. Um, and River Craycraft, you got to put him above that. Now, Craycraft, I think, is kind of fighting an uphill battle now with all this. 
um, all these additions here. Malik Washington, I think, is on on the um, is on the inside because he's a sixth round pick and he caught 110 passes. He's pretty polished. Taj Washington probably has a little still battle. So yeah, I'd, I'd put him fourth among just the purely the wide receivers. Yeah, I'm good with that. I mean, I do want to see a Malik Washington, you know, battle for that, you know, tr- try to, t- you know, push him and, you know, make him work. Because for as much as we love, uh, you know, the potential of Eric Ezukama, I mean, some of these other guys, I mean, when you're watching Malik Washington in t- at school, you can see, the, you know, what type of fit he could have in this offense. So, again, it's a very, very good problem to have. Um, we'll see the way things um, shape up and just going to be something that we continue to watch throughout training camp. But I, I agree with you that he's ahead of Barrios and Barrios is probably only here because of, um, the punt return stuff. I, I mean, I would be okay if they got rid of him and gave that number zero to Jalen Wright like he had in college. I'd be okay. Kat, I don't think this is something we've really been able to talk about. What are your expectations for both Malik Washington and, and Taj Washington? Because I think Kat, or, uh, Josh and I both see them both pushing for uh, 53-man roster spots, and I agree with you that for Taj Washington, it's probably a little more of an uphill battle being that seventh round pick, but should we reel in the expectations a little bit, or do you really see that, you know, by week two, week three, Malik Washington might not be a household name, but somebody who, Hey, he got targeted two times and we're excited to see uh, um, what comes from it. You know, Malik Washington will be fascinating because he's somebody who is a very high volume uh, player at, at Virginia caught 110 mm-hmm. passes last year, but he's purely a slot guy too. So in camp, if you're the seventh or eighth guy and you don't have a whole lot of speed to your game and like Malik Washington has, you might find your opportunities you know, pretty, pretty barren. So, you know, I still love the pick. I can't believe he was there in the sixth round, but the Dolphins may not have been a great team for him to go to either. So, you know, I, th- I think he comes in and he carves a role as that guy you can just plug into the slot and he's polished and he's going to get on the field quickly. Or I think he ends up getting cut. That's wow. to me. It's, it's one of two things there. Um, but I, I bet on the player. Uh, I bet on the guy that, that caught 110 passes last year. And I think he will on the roster. Yeah, I think Taj Washington has a little bit more, um, you know, that speed you're talking about. But I, I think, you know, the reason I've kind of hyped on him is more the aesthetic. I mean, I feel like Malik Washington absolutely has the inside track there. Kind of gives you a little bit of that Jarvis Landry feel to him when you're watching him. But like you mentioned, man, any of these guys could just be either on the roster or could be, you know, poached somewhere else or even just fighting for their NFL career. So definitely something to watch. That's really interesting. So, I mean, I kind of do see Malik Washington as maybe not a this year guy, uh, but I mean, if you're going to kind of really debate the future of Tyree Kill, I'm not saying he's Tyree Kill, but someone who can come in and be a volume type guy, someone who can give eight, nine targets again, you wouldn't, you know, be fearful of cutting someone like that and hoping they'd land on the practice squad. Um, and that's probably why he would make the roster too, if he shows something, because right. when you, when you talk about a sixth round pick, I mean, especially a sixth round pick who was expected to go higher. I mean, um, Curtis Weaver, a couple of years ago, for example, the dolphins cut him and they may not have brought him back or had interest anyway, but that I think the Vikings or the Browns poached him pretty quickly and put him on their 53 man roster. Uh, so if the dolphins had any interest, they, blew it by not keeping him on the roster. Now they didn't actually blow it because the guy's out of the league because he's probably 350 pounds by now. Uh, but um, yeah, it's uh, that, that, that's the thing. Now, you know, if you take a guy who is drafted, you know, in the middle of the seventh round, like Taj Washington, maybe you have a better chance to get him back uh, on the practice squad than, than you do in Malik Washington. So that, I think all that's going to be taken into consideration. One quick thing I looked up, both of them are 23 and uh, Eric Azucam is 24. So I don't know how much, you know, you really care for their age, but the fact that they're kind of so close together, I mean, maybe if Eric Azucam does have that leg up. I mean, who knows? It's just something that we're, uh, we'll be interested to watch. And it's just a crazy problem to have. You know, we're sitting here talking about which wide receivers we can somehow figure a way to keep on the 53 and the practice squad when a couple of years ago, I mean, we all see who Tua is throwing the football to. 2017, uh, Kat, let's wrap with this. Uh wrap the offensive talk with this uh, 2017 Jarvis Landry had 112 receptions for 160 yards. He averaged 8.8 yards per reception. If you had to guess, let's say uh, Malik Washington got 110 receptions in this Miami Dolphins offense. It's gotta be a lot higher than 8.8 yards per reception, right? <laughs> yeah, it would have to be. That's <laughs> God. I hated that. That was, that, was, that was the Jay Cutler year. I remember that. 
where it, the whole offense was just uh, we're we're gonna run the ball, we're gonna operate our offense through Jarvis Landry in the slot, and that's it. Um, Torture. And it was that was that was the worst season. I mean, they're like even like 2019 when the Dolphins went five and eleven. At least it was like oh oh who's this guy? Who's this guy every week? At least there's a little excitement, and you know you're gonna be bad. With Jay Cutler, it's like we've got this veteran roster of just not very good players. And oh god. So to answer your question, um, I don't think he'll catch 110 passes in the NFL ever. Um, if he does, the Dolphins have the steal of the draft. Uh, I'm hoping he can come in and 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 carve out a little role. I'm, I'm trying to think who, what type of historic Dolphins receiver could he be like? That's kind of realistic. Um, uh, Marlon Moore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I, just, I'm just I don't up. know. I'm I'm struggling. He's I'm much struggling better. I think he's it. better than Marlon Moore. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, Brian Manning from like I was like 30 years ago. Uh, somebody who comes in and sees some snaps, God, catch, catches a few passes. But anyway, he's he's a short, stocky receiver. He can make plays after the catch. He just he doesn't have that long speed, and he's not very big. That's that's why he fell in the draft. So it's going to be a fierce competition at wide receiver. What about like Brandon Gibson? Would that be a Pre-injury Brandon Gibson? See, I think that's a good one. And the thing is, you could see him having a role on a team where he's not the 12th option, you know? Right. And that that's – it's a good problem to have, don't get me wrong, but that's kind of what the Dolphins are dealing with there. And, and you know, and that's that's what's going to make the, the, the competition very, very fierce. As long as, long as he's not there giving a uh, – you know, taking the mic over for Tyreek Hill who's, you know – pouting because he didn't get enough targets right that as long as he's not that brandon gibson the dolphins have had three otas so far and josh i want to start this one with you david long jr cater kohu and austin jackson have all been named orange jersey winners any of those guys stick out to you i mean i'm stoked for i mean can i say i'm stoked for all of them i mean we see david long now he's the veteran in the middle of that defense taking the next step i'm excited for him and jordan brooks and we i mean we're big darth cater fans the fact that the dolphins even tweeted out darth cater was wearing the orange that's awesome and then austin jackson the fact he's you know stacking another good season at least in the off season you know you can only do so much it sounds like he's um you know the same player that we all fell in love with and signed that contract in the off season. So I'm cool with all this. It always seems like they give it to the veteran though. And then, you know, try to like motivate the younger players. Um, intrigued to see who's next, but um, yeah, no one really stuck out. What about you, Kat? Anybody really stand out to you? Uh, Cater Kohu is an important player in this defense because, you know, as, as the fifth guy, if he plays like he did as a rookie, I mean, he really takes the Dolphins defense to the next level. And last year, it was really up and down. And I, I still have a lot. He's one player on the roster, even though he didn't play all that great last year as somebody I have a lot of faith in still. Um, I, I think he's going to, I think he's big enough. He's fast enough. And, and, and he's going to have a good career that, and it's going to be big for the dolphins. If he does, uh, I've got a bone to pick with David long. I don't like the, the move from 51 to 11, the Jersey number. That's just, it's not 51 is an imposing middle linebacker number. Now you switch to 11, Devontae Parker's old number. Come on. So. Mike Wallace. Yeah, Mike Scary. Wallace. What are you thinking? I mean. What about Patrick Paul wearing 52? Did you do you have a comment on that? <laughs> Isn't yeah, that what number like is rocking like a middle linebacker? I don't like it either. I, I think he needs to have a number in the 70s. I mean, and I hope he switches. Uh, yeah, I mean, come on. Where, where number, who's who's wearing 78 now on the team? Probably, that's probably, I mean, but where Richmond Webb's old number? He, he's, he's kind of the guy that I compared uh, I compared him a little bit to Richmond Webb when uh, uh, when when Paul was drafted. I mean, he's got to get better with his hands and his feet. Richmond Webb was way more polished in that area, but the size, the natural pass protection skills, um, the I'd like to see him wear number seventy eight. I don't know if it's because I'm just uh, a little younger, but give me a, a big seventy seven. Give me like a Jake Long looking like seventy seven out there. I I, I think that look much better than a. Uh, uh, Philip Wheeler, number 52, stuck on an island over there on the uh, left side. The the kid in me always looks at their uh, roster and sees that 69 is available. So I always just want a player, one of these offensive linemen, to just do what, you know, Connor Williams, maybe when they sign him at, inevitably. That's it. Josh, That that's something I'm kind of hoping to, that we get that maybe a, a Adam Schefter notification early August. The Dolphins have reached a one-year deal with to bring back Connor Williams. That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, Ken, I want to ask you, though, David Long, you have Anthony Walker coming in. You have Jordan Brooks coming in. 
is this going to be a linebacker remodeling that looks like the unit that replaced Carlos Dansby and Kevin Burnett, or are the Dolphins finally reaching a new age where they're going to have a linebacker unit that can be scary to opposing offenses? Right, and if you look at Anthony Weaver historically, um, you know, just look where, where he was in Baltimore, you know, the money and the draft picks that they put into Roquan Smith and they put into Patrick Queen. I know Patrick Queen's with the Steelers now, but middle inside linebacker is a very important position for them. And you wonder how much of that he's taking with him to the Dolphins. And now you've got uh, got Jordan Brooks, who you spent a lot of money on. Uh, David Long is earning, what, five or six million a year. Um, and Anthony Walker too. I mean, Anthony Walker has been a starter in this, in this league for, for a couple of years with the okay. Colts and the Browns. So, and you've got Duke Riley and Janning Tindall somewhere around here still. <laughs> uh, but you've got a lot, you've got a lot of bodies there. So yeah, it's, it is going to be a lot more important. And I think they're looking to be uh, a more imposing thumping type of, of linebacker unit than they've been in the past with Jerome Baker back there. We did get a bit of drama coming from Javon Holland, who literally kicked rocks when Vic Fangio uh, left Miami, signed with the Philadelphia Eagles. Javon Holland was asked about Anthony Weaver taking over the defense after Vic Fangio. He said it's a complete 180, and it starts with Anthony Weaver just being a good person. Um, (laughs) Josh, what do you think about Salty Javon? I mean, (laughs) I couldn't believe that there were so many people saying this was unfair to Vic Fangio. But I mean, this is just like at this point, he it's just funny, man. I'm happy that we have players who can go out there and express themselves in a way and and do it in a way where they're comfortable with it, man. I think above all else, that that I think is important. Yeah, I'm just dying laughing because he just, you know, straight up said the fact that he's not a good person. And, you know, when he kicked the rocks, I think he even kind of backtracked a little bit and kind of made it seem like it could have just been anything. But, um, yeah, be, being able to go out there and express themselves through the media, I know Mike McDaniel talked about that. Um, it was nice to hear him being honest. I know that people are saying it's unfair to Vic. I don't understand that. I mean, even – well, I'll let you talk about the Jalen Ramsey quote. But even when, you know, nobody seemed happy with the type of guy that Vic Fangio did. And let's be honest, we all feel like there could have been more – um, he could have got a little bit more juice out of that defense. So love what we're hearing about Anthony Weaver early on, especially from Mike McDaniel. I mean, he's talking about how they have like the same view of the NFL, you know, trying to stay up on schematics and, you know, innovation and things like that. Everything you want to hear the opposite of Vic Fangio almost coming in here saying we're going to do things my way or the highway. You love to hear that Anthony Weaver is going to bring that type of approach. So um, love that Javon Hans speaking out, hope that he can take that next step and be that player that we all thought he could be last season. And apparently he wasn't able to be under Vic Fangio. Vic Fangio, just God, the secondary hated this guy. I mean, it's the it's. I mean, I, when you ask me about a draft pick or, or a draft prospect, uh, uh, if I don't if I don't like him, I'm, I'm just gonna say, okay, he's got good size and speed. He's just a terrible person. Uh, <laughs> he's just a terrible. Like, jeez. Like, I mean, I look. I it's quite obvious that that the secondary despised him, and it, you know. I can understand why they're frustrated. I mean, Javon Holland, when he had his best season a couple of years ago, he was moved all around the field. You remember that Ravens game on Monday night against uh, Lamar Jackson? I mean, he was playing center field in some looks. He was sneaking down in the box. He was blitzing. I mean, to just put him basically in one or two spots, yeah, he's going to be frustrated. And Jalen Ramsey, the same thing happened with him. So, And who knows what was going on with Cam Smith. I know Cam Smith was a rookie, but Really? How many snaps do you have? Nine uh, last year? And he was, I mean, you can't carve some sort of rollout for that guy. Uh, you know, I, so I'm, I'm happy, I, but I'm happier more of what I thought of Anthony Weaver. You know, I, th- I thought that was a really good get and meshes well with the, with the personnel the Dolphins have. Yeah, what Jalen Ramsey said basically after Vangio left, he posted pictures of uh, him and Xavier Howard saying, I won't ever forgive dude for not utilizing our full skill set, uh, which I thought was very, very funny. And I, I do appreciate that all the players are coming out. I mean, and the thing is, Vic Vangio had press conferences where there were times where reporters would ask him and maybe a little too leniently like, are you sure you want to bury Cam Smith this badly? Like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, he just isn't good at anything. (laughs) Just completely saying nothing to build him up whatsoever. So I do get that spite and I do get how some players are just, you know, 
going to take every chance they can to, to throw jabs his way. Uh, but uh, to kind of wrap up here on another Dolphins podcast, what should we expect from this Anthony Weaver defense in terms of the secondary? You mentioned it before that Cater Co, who he had some situations last year where he was just kind of put through a blender. He was left on an island one-on-one at times. When you look at this Dolphins depth chart, I'm excited. You know, you have Jalen Ramsey, Kendall Fuller at the top. You have Cater Co, who probably stepping in for the slot. But, I mean, after that, you have Nick Needham, who's cross-training at safety. Storm Duck is undrafted free agent. You mentioned Cam Smith. If there's another injury, it kind of feels like last year where the Dolphins are going to be kind of tied with their hands behind their back, struggling in the secondary. Yeah, I mean, when looking through at this through the eyes of Anthony Weaver from last year, I mean, uh, he had to know and observe what Kyle Hamilton did for that defense. And I look at... Jalen Ramsey being able to use him in the slot and for that to happen have boundary cornerbacks that's why you know you've got Kendall Fuller out on one boundary but having Cater Kohu and or Cam Smith step up as that other guy is going to allow Jalen Ramsey to play more of that Kyle Hamilton type of role and I just think players are going to move around more in general I mean Vic Fangio's defense has always been you know the same guys are pretty much going to line up in the same places on the field all the time. And then after the snap, we're going to look to switch the picture around. That's not Anthony Weaver's defensive style of, of football, or at least that's not what we're anticipating. So um, I'm looking forward to the secondary having more fun this year. And, you know, it's, if, if they stay healthy, I mean, that's, it's a talented group of veteran players. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking back now, thinking about it. And I believe there was a time when Jalen Ramsey was kind of surprised. There was a presser where he said, uh, Vic Fangio said like, we're going to move you around during this game. And he's like, Vic, they really, Vic really said that we'll see or something like that. So they're all going to be able to, you know, just go out there and do things that I think they're better suited for. I mean, you mentioned Jalen Ramsey being able to play in a slot, but if we really, I mean, if we had the safeties to do it, I mean, Javon Holland can also come down and play in a slot. I mean, there's so many interchangeable pieces and, uh, you know, players that, Anthony Weaver's disposable. I'm excited to see what happens. And I got a joke, but I think uh, Travis Wingfield also tweeted out that Ethan Bonner looked really good out there. So White Mamba, uh, can't forget him in this battle as well. So I, I, I like this defensive back unit, but like I think Jake said, if they if we do start to see a couple guys get hurt, banged up, inevitably like we do see throughout the season, then I'm going to start feeling a little bit queasy, and then who's going to step up to the occasion? So cream rises to the top. Kat, you'd be comfortable with guys like Cam Smith and, and Cater Kohu being maybe that pseudo boundary corner when you move Ramsey inside because, you know, off season bias here. Storm Duck has always been one of those boundary cornerbacks. He even plays defense a little, a little safer. He'll take a few extra steps off. Do you think there's any scenario where the Dolphins might be looking for a specific boundary guy where, you know, Cater Kohu had a little bit of struggles with that? Cam Smith, a little more physical. You can see him lining up in the slot as well. Yeah, um, Storm Duck, great name, undrafted free agent. Um, it faces an uphill battle. Uh, you know, I, I'm i rooting for the guy, Cater Coe, who's an undrafted free agent too. So is Nick Needham. Um, you know, I, I don't think they would go the veteran route. You know, Stefan Gilmore, if you're looking for a, a veteran corner, probably would be a little bit too pricey, but I believe still out there. Um, yeah, so we'll, th- that'll be an interesting competition. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, just going to say the same thing. And the fact that, you know, we have seen Cater out there. We have seen Nick Needham, who sounds like he's playing at safety. So there are guys that can play the boundary. I just don't know, like you said, Jake. If I'd be confident, I mean, you mentioned Cam Smith. I was confident what I saw in his college tape, at least from one of the few games I watched. And uh, clearly Vic Fangio felt differently. But gentlemen, it was great to be back here talking Miami Dolphins football with you both. And that is it. That is all the time we have today. So thank you all so much for listening to another episode of another Dolphins podcast. If you made it until the end of the show, might as well give you one more reminder. If you would like to get a free copy of College Football 25, all you have to do to be entered into a drawing to win a free copy is send a Dolphins or football related question to another Dolphins podcast at gmail.com. We'll give you two additional entries if you include a screenshot of you rating the show on the app of your choice. But that is it. That is all the time we have today. Thank you so much for listening to another Dolphins podcast. Go out, have a wonderful weekend. And until next time, fins up. Fins up. Fins up. Fins up.